Hi, I'm Larry Menti. Welcome to Another Thing. We take the show today to the campus of Rutgers University because there is a professor here who used to be the acting undersecretary for the Department of Homeland Security. And we're going to talk to him about the fight over social media in fighting terrorism. Everybody knows that the terrorists are using social media to recruit lone wolves both in this country and abroad. The question is, how do you stop them? The answer is not as easy as you might think. We begin our coverage with Ellen Kaloje. Thank you, Larry. Well, the FBI is investigating the so-called digital footprint of the man accused of shooting a Philadelphia police officer allegedly in the name of Islam. They're looking through his cell phone records, looking at who he spoke to online, and going through his computer hard drive, all to see if he has any ties to terrorists to locate the motives, to locate his background, and then using that evidence to work backwards and then try to locate, if any, uh, if there are colleagues or networks he was in contact with on the domestic front that helped him carry out the attack. Sean Yam is an assistant professor of political science at Temple University. He says it's much easier to use social media and technology after a terrorist attack happens than to use it to stop one from ever taking place. For instance, if the Parisian authorities were to have arrested every single French citizen with an Algerian or Moroccan surname who online uh, said that they wanted to do harm to the West, they would be arresting many, many, many people, the vast majority of whom would have no connection to terrorism. There's no disputing ISIS and other terrorist groups use technology wisely. They're a bunch of killers with good social media. And uh, they are dangerous and they've caused great hardship to people. The goal is to cut through all the noise and pinpoint credible threats. Authorities have taken a lot of heat for missing red flags after the San Bernardino shootings. The woman behind the attack posted her support for violent jihad on Facebook long before she came to the U.S. on a fiancé visa. That's just one reason the feds held a meeting with Silicon Valley recently, asking tech companies to do more to weed out possible terrorists or help law enforcement when groups use encrypted messages to plan attacks. Now, the big social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, well, they say they're already doing a lot to help fight terrorism by taking down suspicious posts and any incriminating videos or propaganda. They say for everyone, the challenge is to try to keep people safe while at the same time protecting our First Amendment and privacy rights. Reporting for Another Thing, I'm Ellen Kaloje. Thank you, Ellen. Continuing our conversation now, I'd like to introduce John Cohen, who is the former acting undersecretary and coordinator of counterterrorism for the Department of Homeland Security. He now is a professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Criminal Justice. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Uh, before we get into social media, I just want to get the size of the threat because there seems to be two trains of thought. One came from the president during his during his State of the Union address when he said that it isn't the threat that everybody thinks it is. ISIS is not the threat everyone thinks it is. And seemed to even at one point say that ISIS is of some guys in the back of a pickup truck. Then you have other people who say it's the greatest threat since 9-11. Is it somewhere in between, or who's telling the truth on that? Well, it's different. We're facing a threat that in many ways is more complex, more complicated, and more difficult to deal with than the threat we faced on 9-11. We certainly still have to be concerned about the threat posed by people who are associated with international terrorist organizations like ISIS, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, who work within their command and control structure, and who carry out attacks on their behalf. But the new element of the threat today that we face, and this is what's really difficult for law enforcement and counterterrorism authorities to get their arms around, is that we also have to be concerned about individuals who become inspired by the ideology of groups like ISIS. They're inspired by what they see on social media, but they act independent of its command and control infrastructure. So if they are communicating with a recruiter, they're doing it through encrypted technologies. It, but more often than not, they're not communicating with the group at all. They're acting independently and they're carrying out attacks at home. The reason why that's so difficult is our traditional counterterrorism capabilities, which are very robust, which depend on our intelligence community, on our international law enforcement relationships, was never designed to pick up a, the threat of an individual who's becoming radicalized in their home, who's preparing for an attack without leaving their home by 
using the internet and carrying out attacks, never communicating with a terrorist organization. I, I would think the key to finding that individual is tracking down communication between that individual and ISIS or Al-Qaeda or wherever the, whatever the mentor is in a terrorist community. That must be difficult. Have we caught up yet? Well, we've built an entire intelligence capability that's designed to do exactly what you described. When people associated with a terrorist organization are in communication with its leaders, with their command staff, with their command and control infrastructure, we work to pick up those communications. When people meet with recruiters or with their commanders from the terrorist organization, we we are very good at picking up those meetings. But picture this, we now have people that if they're communicating, are communicating over encrypted communication capabilities that we can't break into, as powerful as our capabilities are. But we also have people who aren't communicating at all. They're staying in their hometown, they're not traveling, they're not going to Syria or Iraq. They are staying at home and they are becoming radicalized, increasingly angry, and and what we're seeing is that they are actually willing to carry out attacks in their hometowns on behalf of these organizations. Every, every time they talk about social media I inspiring, possibly inspiring a lone wolf, the talk is Twitter and, and Facebook. And yet it seems like, and you correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like some of the terrorist organizations are a step ahead. For instance, in Paris, it was, it was gaming sites we found out later. And in San Bernardino, it was a dating site mm -hmm. that radicalized someone. Are we always playing catch up? Well, what your, question, what your question illustrates is that these groups are very sophisticated and have become increasingly sophisticated in their use of social media in two ways. One, they are very good at finding platforms and moving and changing those platforms when they believe it's been compromised by law enforcement or intelligence. But what's even more sophisticated is the material they're posting on social media. These groups, groups like ISIS in particular, have developed these dynamic, social media campaigns that are specifically designed not only to attract Westerners, but be inspirational to a subset of our population that's vulnerable to this type of incitement. Is Donald Trump right that we're being too politically correct in talking about this? Is that subset, are the people that they after mostly Muslim? No, actually what we're seeing is that um, the vast majority of people who have gravitated towards this cause recently um, are not lifelong adherents to, to the Muslim religion. Um, typically, uh, the folks that have been arrested or uh, that have carried out these attacks have only relatively recently um, become uh, tuned in to the whole Muslim faith. So. Trying to define this problem, saying it's a problem solely within the Muslim community, is just inaccurate. And it's not that we're being politically correct, it's that this is a nuanced, complex issue that doesn't necessarily fit into neat little boxes. That's been a big part of the work that we've been doing here at Rutgers, is to really truly understand the psychological uh, and the behavioral characteristics, the life experience characteristics of these individuals who are not only becoming inspired by these extremist ideologies, but most importantly, are willing to carry out violence and on its behalf. You're a counterterrorism professional. Uh, you, you don't play politics. You have one job to do, and that's to stop a terrorist attack. How much does politics get in your way? It, it, it doesn't get in my way because there, is, there are people in the federal government, at the FBI, at the Department of Homeland Security, in the intelligence community, who, who don't play politics. They're not involved in what goes on at the senior leadership levels. Their one job, their, their true focus, is to protect this country. I think where we run into problems is, and your earlier question sort of pointed to this, this is a threat environment that evolves. It constantly evolves and it changes. And the way that we do government at the federal level is very structured, very programmatic. In some cases, based on the threat of yesterday. What we need to do better is to inject analysis and research, such as that that's going on at Rutgers and other academic institutions around the country, that's going on at places like the FBI, and have policymakers truly understand not how the threat is today, but how it's going to be tomorrow. When we come back, we're going to take a break real quick. When we come back, I want to talk about Twitter and Facebook and some of the social media sites and how helpful they have been so we can get off politics and get back on track. We're talking to John Cohen, professor at Rutgers University and former acting undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security when we return.